So good morning, everybody. Now we come to our period of preparation. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever. Amen. And the collect for today, the third Sunday of Lent. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection we are promised. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now Gail's going to bring us our reading. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And so may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be in the name of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I'm reminded by uh, today's passage, which we've heard, the film clip that James has prepared and shown us, and um, then the contrast with the Bath Abbey Choir, that the work of a sermon, as it were, happens before the occasion, one trust during it, but actually as important in the days following. And already we've got striking, challenging images, thoughts in our minds. And so, the work of the sermon is for all of us together to seek, discern what God would say to us. Possibly one of the things, one of the few things it might be that we will remember from school days and RE lessons or whatever it was called at the time. I think it changed its name about eight times while I was at school. Um, would be um, drawing a, a, a map drawing a, a plan of the Jerus of the temple in Jerusalem, seeing pictures of it too, possibly even having models or making them. It goes with St Paul's journeys, learning those, things that you wonder really, or on reflection, were they any relevance, helpful to have known about, but did we grasp some of the deeper points? So with the temple, its significance, is apart from its design, which is actually quite significant in itself, <clears throat> particularly the sort of inner place that nobody really could go into. Um, but its significance is as a place of pilgrimage, perhaps a focus and even a place of unity. For with just one temple, everybody who might be able to go there is doing the same thing. You can't, so you can't compare the temple with say, cathedrals because we have more than one of them um, but above all above all God's special dwelling place not suggesting he wasn't known elsewhere but on, often that was forgotten and the temple perhaps was given more importance or it was 
its significance was lost sight. Today we hear how Jesus goes to the temple. We see how he drives out those selling animals for sacrifices and, the ta and turns over the tables of the money changers. All of that going on in a corrupt way, an unfair way, an unreasonable way, and favouring those who are already comfortably off. We could go into digressions about cathedral shops, cafes, church shops, etc. That's not the key thing, perhaps, at the moment. And, and Jesus acts violently, as we've been reminded. And the people around ask for a sign. I guess they're asking <clears throat> to know what Jesus's authority is. Who does he think he is? Talking, acting in this way, not just talking, acting in this way, in this most holy place. But he goes on to speak of the destruction of the temple, more violent still, really, disturbing, distressing, alarming. But he also speaks of raising it up again in three days. How can that be, they say? It's taken us ages, years to build it and it's not quite finished. He will raise it in three days. And St. John, who can be a bit difficult to follow, in today's passage seems to be particularly helpful and clear in uh, succinct ways. Jesus, uh, we're told, was speaking of the temple of his body, God's dwelling place in his own person. We call as ever <clears throat> the gospel writers do their work after the resurrection of Jesus in the earliest days of the Christian church. And in fact, apart from Mark, they did their work after the temple had been destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. And again, John tells us briefly, simply, how later on, and this must have been so often the case, later on after the resurrection, the disciples remembered his words after he was raised from the dead about the temple of his body. Only John tells us about Jesus going to the temple early on in his ministry. The other three tell us about this in the last week of Jesus's life, where an awful lot is focused on the temple, uh, not surprisingly. There's lots of ways of looking at each of the Gospels, but a key way of looking at John's Gospel is that it is a book of signs, signs showing who Jesus is, revealing his glory, the glory which is God's own glory. But he places this incident here, I think, to make clear at the outset that the whole Gospel is the account of Jesus's glory, and his glory is seen in both the cross and the resurrection. They cannot be separated, they go together. The cross is no less a moment of glory than the resurrection, and that is a key message we have in our minds at this early stage of reading his gospel. Our church buildings haven't been destroyed. Uh, less people now who remember the war years, but particularly in some places, Coventry too, buildings in the war were destroyed. Um, and sometimes buildings are destroyed, church buildings in other ways, fire sometimes, deliberate attack. But we've had a period almost a year ago now, the hymn board in uh, Corfectory, Corf, not rectory, Paul Vestry still says March the 15th. I feel we shall have a symbolic moment of wiping that clean when we're next singing hymns. Anyway, we've had this long period. First of all, we couldn't use our churches. Then a period, easy to forget it now, of trying to get our heads around the guidance, the regulations from the government, the church, the insurers. I think I literally had a headache for about a week and wasn't alone. Um, and there are other times when the church's life and work is hindered for all sorts of reasons. When we get things wrong, dreadfully wrong, 
and people are ready to condemn us, to challenge us. And sometimes, and I've always find this very challenging, there are one or two, more than one or two, if you listen closely, they actually want to hear the challenging voice, the prophetic voice, the voice and actions that we heard and saw in Jesus. Yes, clearly, lots of things to be careful about there, to discuss as clearly as happening in the Lent groups. But there are people, not necessarily in the thick of church life, you might say, they would see us failing because they don't hear that prophetic voice. Um, anyway, through this time in this last year, I think we can say we've rediscovered lots of important things. It's a bit like, in part, we've been on an awfully long retreat. You probably, those who've not been on a retreat, wondered what such an experience can be like. Um, it can be both frightening, daunting, and incredibly renewing. And we've experienced some of that, all of us. We've rediscovered the important things we would want to say with the words and eyes of faith. God has shown us, reminded us in this particular way, not deliberately, but he's reminded us of those important things. Each of us is to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, God's presence. St. Paul teaches us about that in particular. Together, albeit it has been in a restricted way and a limited way, but put all the ways together, we have been, are being, God's temple, his dwelling place. Yes, we know we fail, we know we're flawed, we know we need more and more his forgiveness, but he is working through us nonetheless. The question has been raised by many voices within the church and around. Um, how many churches can we manage to reopen? That was the earlier question, perhaps change it to sustain. Uh, James and I have heard that quite a bit at rural deans meetings, clergy meetings, but also in the press, there are articles and letters. Some of you have taken part in that debate. Um, and it's not, people are not just asking, can we afford Archer? Don't panic, I'm not suggesting immediate closure at all. Um, uh, but people are saying, uh, not just in financial terms, can we have we the resources? I never liked the phrase human resources, but it just seems quite appropriate here. Have we the energy um, to look after our buildings and all that goes with that? And it's not just fettling, sorry, that's a Yorkshire word, cleaning. It's not just cleaning, it's governance, as we're now far more conscious of, organizing, sorting, and so on. Have we the energies, or is that where our energies should be going? And as I say, the question is asked within the church, in our own benefits, it was asked quite, it was expressed forcibly, not forcibly, although clearly, um, definitely, in some of our consultations over our changes, um, the three Hills PCCs becoming one. So it's a real, real question. We were discussing and we are discussing the service pattern for this reopening and the future, trying to look at what is appropriate, what is um, sensible, etc. And someone said in our discussion on Zoom, you should pray about this. And that can seem a sort of slick, obvious and ready answer. But actually, it's so, so important. And it's so with this question of buildings. And um, how do we pray? I guess there are as many ways of praying as there are people sharing in this service. In other words, each uh, our own, discover our own way with God. And sometimes, if you like, the penny drops, God speaks to us, we see something clearly, and our imaginations come into it, and it might be the unexpected answer, and it might be something we've come to see together. So do pray about this. 
here particularly, I think, we're not going to, we couldn't say, oh, we just can't manage that building. Uh, so many of you will have lived in more urban areas and um, certainly where I was in the north, we most of the churches were built from the Industrial Revolution. Some, uh, so, sorry, at that time and thereafter. And some were very solid and well built, like I think Kingston is. Could be right if I put if I'm wrong. Some of them were less well built and less good buildings, and actually an awful lot of closed. And they've closed with so closed with far bigger con, uh, populations in parishes than we have. But perhaps this is one thing where being a visitor holiday tourist area may help. So pray, imaginations. There are a variety of ways that can make a difference. But above all, above all, we are ourselves and God's people to be his temple. Some fine church buildings, cathedrals speak most particularly. Our hope perhaps is that our lives, our life together as God's people will also speak. He will be able to speak through us. Amen. Let us pray. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Now John and Dawn are going to lead us in the creed. I believe, I believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Creator, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, Son our Lord, who was, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin, Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now Chris is going to bring us our intercession. Heavenly Father, during this period of Lent, we follow the road that our Saviour Jesus Christ strode on his journey to the cross. This morning, we have heard how he railed at accepted practices condoned by everyone who worshipped at the temple, both the priests and the congregations. <clears throat> makes us think about those things we accept which might offend Jesus if he visited us today. Perhaps a lingering attitude to people who are different from us. Or our use of a coded language that might mystify anyone seeking to embrace the Christian faith. Dear Lord, Help us to see ourselves as others see us and be prepared to evaluate that image and be open-minded enough to make changes where we see anew things that dismay us. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the miracle of science that vaccinations have proved to be. Ahead of us, we can begin to hope for a less traumatic future. Be with us as we sensitively look for ways to memorialize this time, which our whole community can appreciate. Also guide us as we plan our way back, not just to parish normality, but to something even more worthy of you that will help to transform the lives of those neighbours we touch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dearest God, we know that your Son opened our eyes and named you love itself, eternally present, if we but reach out to join you in the work of the Holy Spirit in this place. Help us to see those in need through your eyes, whether they are our next door neighbors or people in lands far away. In this time of Lent, help us to pinpoint people who need our help and with gratitude in our hearts for the precious gift that we have or are about to receive, give generously to help those who are behind us in the queue. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us not to take for granted all those who have continued to serve us during this time of trial. Medical and care home staff, of course, but also shop workers, dustmen, people who repair our homes, and those we don't see in countless factories and offices up and down the land, not forgetting those who bring us the news. We have so much to be grateful for. May we be humble in their presence. This coming week, children will return to school and we ask you 
to protect them and their hard-working teachers. We think especially of our own schools here in Corf and Langton. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This morning we pray for the 20 million people in the world who are still suffering from coronavirus. May they be cared for in the best possible way. In a moment of silence, let us pray for those we know who are unwell or are awaiting results of tests. And let us add our thanks for the successful operation the Duke of Edinburgh has received. We now wish him a speedy recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At home, we remember those in these parishes who have died recently and ask you to enfold the loved ones they have left behind in your loving arms. We also cannot forget the hundred thousand or so who have died in the UK of the virus. Sadly, we have become so used to hearing the numbers that the heart-piercing horror we once felt has disappeared, which may make us blasé to the perils that still lurk wherever people meet. As we become aware of the new surge of the disease in parts of Europe, help us not to repeat our own mistakes of the summer when the shops and pubs open later this year. Through caring diligence, may ways be found to reach those isolated by culture, poverty, language, or misinformation, who are in danger of being left out from the protective help that is at hand. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our, our Father, Father, which art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never put it out. Alleluia. Alleluia. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is our peace the indestructible peace we now share with each other. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also with you. And let us offer one another a sign of that peace. Peace, peace. peace of the Lord be always with you. 